Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. This is your guest host again, Cliff Gray. Today I have Robbie Denning on the podcast. Robbie is a well-known mule deer hunter and enthusiast. And Robbie is the author of Hunting Big Mule Deer, How to Take the Best Buck of Your Life. And just so all of the audience knows out there, when people ask me, they say, hey man, what's, a, what's like some good reading material that I can read to get into deer hunting or just hunting in the West? Uh, this is always the book I recommend. So I don't think I've ever told you that, Robbie, but this is like the number one on my list. And uh, I'll be honest, man, I just last night, I bought your other book, uh, Hunting Big Mule Deer, The Stories on my Kindle. Um, I've just had so much going on in life. I haven't gotten uh, gotten through it, but I will here in the next next few weeks. So I'm thinking that that's probably after I get done with it, that's going to be up on my, my list also to recommend uh, to hunters. And really, uh, the reason I recommend it is right when I started reading that book, I had I, I had done a fair amount of mule deer guiding, a fair amount of mule deer hunting. And when I was reading it, it was just, I guess to be short about it, is it was just authentic. Like I could, like things that you you wrote about in there, Robbie, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. And not only does it make sense, like I've partially been doing that just kind of on my own. I started to figure it out, but the way you put it out there, all the different tactics, you know, it's not, the whole book is not just about glassing. It covers all the other tactics that I think a lot of people overlook when they're, when they're hunting mule deer, just all that. It just hit me in my mind. Like, Oh yeah, this guy's actually the real deal for sure. Like he's not making this up because I'm starting to connect the dots here. So those are awesome. But well, the first book I know is awesome. I'm pretty sure the second one's going to be awesome too. So I recommend everybody go check them out. Um, on the other fronts, I know Robbie's uh, heavily involved in the Rock Slide uh, Forum, and I and I know that Robbie just has a lifelong passion for mule deer hunting. So we're gonna we're gonna delve into that and uh, go from there. Anything I'm missing, Robbie? No, man. Hey, dude, thank you for the best intro I've ever had on the books, man. <laughs> I really appreciate that. You know, um, I, I I love to write. You know, I went to school to be a writer. Um, you know, like most writers, you got to have another job to support your writing habit, and so it always always helps when people are talking about the books. And and um and and thank you. I'm I'm glad you connected with a with a hunting big mule deer, uh, book the first one at that level because really all it is if it's authentic, it's just because it was my journal of mule deer hunting for thirty years. Um, I, I put to book form. Um, so I'm, I, I, I'm always glad when somebody that's got a lot of mule deer experience, uh, reads it and they connect with it. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate that. One question I have on it, Robbie, and this is, I guess, a uh, question for the newer book is I see the title of the newer book is the stories. But one thing that was cool about the first book I thought is you would, you know, there's segments of it that I would call very tactical and advice. And, you know, this, this is, you know, how I approach things. And then you actually have stories in that first book too. So what, uh, I mean, if you don't mind me asking, what's the big difference in the second book? Oh yeah. I, I, I'm glad you asked. Cause that's all the difference right there it was the, the first book I noticed, um, after I put it out and, and this is a little bit in the intro of, of the second book, the stories was, I had a lot of guys who were like, Hey man, thanks for the how to, it was great to go deeper than just glassing. Cause there is a lot more to mule deer hunting than just glassing. Although I love glassing. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but a lot of them would just always leave me with a side note of, man, I just wish you to put more stories in it. We, we love the stories. And, and, you know, I grew up in the days of, you know, outdoor life and, you know, uh, you know, Kurt Darner, you know, Colorado, and you learn through all those stories, you know, uh, you know, Bob Robb, Dwight Shue, all those guys, you know, they would, they, they, they would, they would give you a point, give you a tactic, and then they would give you a story to illustrate it. And I just think that's the best way to learn, man. I mean, you know, it's my personal opinion. That's how, that's how humans have been learning for, for eons. And so when, when people started saying that, like, we want more stories, I'm like, oh man, I got stories. In fact, I was shortening them up in the first book. Cause I'm, I'm like, you know, I can't turn this into a 500 page storybook. So, right. But the second book, man, I, I pulled out all stops and uh, that's what I did. And, 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 you know, I still like reading books, you know, digitally, the whole digital world is, it's so distracting. You know, I, 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 I'm glad you bought my book on your phone. Uh, that, that, that's great because now you got the whole color version of it. Um, oh, okay. but you know, do for me, just when I'm on my phone, phone is work for me. You know what I mean? That's where my oh, email yeah. is. That's where my, yeah. you know, I got 30 employees texting me all the time. And so to just to be able to dive into a book, 
what was the same just authoring the book was I just got to really mind focus on those stories and stories to me are are just kind of a way to relive your hunt so I really enjoy writing them and 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 I was giddy when people said they wanted more stories because I was like, okay, let, let's do it. And so that's that's what you're holding in your hands there that, that you bought last night. And I, I appreciate you buying that. And um, you'll, you'll have to let me know what you think. And because there's, you know, there's a lot of successful mule deer hunters out there, you'll see I recruited eight or nine other guys to, to submit a story too. I think I have eight or nine stories in there. And then with those other guys in there, you know, we're pushing 20, you know, long form mule deer stories and a- almost every one of them is designed to teach. You know, if you really uh, pay attention to what's going on, look, look at how the guy is thinking and the gal, there's a gal in there too, making decisions on, uh, on the ground and, you know, pre hunt, you know, all that kind of stuff. I think there's something there for, for even the how to guys, you know, that just want to, yeah. you know, tell me what to do. I, I, and so that's what that book's designed to do. That's why it's 400 pages long. The other books, 275, you know, there's, you can really go deep in stories. So that, that's how it, it happened right there, Cliff. Yeah, I like it, man. You know, it, it's funny because even as a kid, Robbie, like I kind of in, in the hunting realm, I think a lot of my learning has actually come from just people telling, you know, hunting stories. And and even if they're even if they're partially, you know, tall tales or whatever, you still learn uh-huh. from them. And it's mm-hmm. almost like stories are like experience is best, right? Like I I always tell people and, and I know it's hard because we all have life, you know, we have life and kids and family and work. But to me, you know, it's just the old cliche. The best way to get good at these things is time in the field. And then if you can, if you can, you know, hunt a lot during a season, you not just go for three or four days. So, so anyways, that's, I always tell people that, but it's pretty, it's impractical for most folks, but these stories that people tell you, you know, about this buck or that buck, and I'm sure these stories in your book, they're like just right under under actual experience, right? In terms of just getting the mm-hmm. knowledge ingrained in your brain. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. This is what happened. This is how it happened. And then as you're reading that, you can kind of you know draw your own conclusions. You know, see yourself in the situation, and and you know that's why I mentioned Kurt Darner because that was you know it doesn't matter how people feel about him. He he still he still kind of changed mule deer hunting forever. And yeah, sure. uh, you know, I just remember being like 18, 19 years old. You know, reading his book, and I'm like, oh. This is- awesome and you know then i would be in the field and i would remember those stories and be able to pull things from them of okay well maybe i could expect this or i'm looking for this and you know and, and i grew up in a mule deer family my dad taught me all that stuff but I, it still took me to to a deeper level um you know studying other successful hunters yeah no i i hear you um and robbie i uh when i did crack open the second book yesterday and this, I'm, I'm going to like break out like a, like a philosophical question right off the bat, man. <laughs> oh, I noticed, oh. So, so in your bio, <laughs> the last line of your bio, it says one of Robbie's goals is to become the best mule deer hunter he can be. And so I'm, I'm in my mind, I'm thinking that you probably chose the words in this sen- sentence for, for a reason. Right. And it kind of struck me, man, because it's, I can tell from just following you that mule deer hunting is more than a hobby to you. It's like mm-hmm. a, you know, it's a lifelong endeavor and it, it almost seems like you view it as like a, like an art that you want to master, but you know, you're never going to master. Is, is, is that, is that where you come from on this or what's your perspective just on, on how you stay so focused on mule deer hunting? Well, hey, man, I should have consulted with you before I wrote that bio, man. You just you <laughs> had a couple of gems in there because because it is more than just hunting, and that those words were very carefully chosen, you know. And I and I've thought those words for many years. I want to I want to be the best mule deer hunter I can be, and I think just as humans, we're competitive. And dude, there's some awesome mule deer hunters out there. There's guys that are you know way better at it than me. And and you know, of course, when I was younger, you know, I thought I had to compete with the whole world. And 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 to answer your question. I love mule deer hunting. I love the process. It, 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 I love it to the point that, I mean, I just came off a three year slump, finally punched a tag this year. And, you know, it's tough to go that many years without, without shooting a, a, a buck, but it was okay because I love the process. So 
I decided in my, you know, probably 20s, early 30s, I just wanted to be the best I can be. I don't have to compete with all these other guys. I don't have to be better than somebody else. And, you know, that's not really what it's all about is, but I want to be the best I can be. And so that's why I, I read, I learn, I, I follow people like you on, on Instagram. Your stuff is, you know, really helpful, really, really uh, teaching, you know, things like that. Cause you know, I read, if you, if you go to the rock slide blog, you know, you see, I've, I've reviewed about every mule deer book that's out there. I just reviewed a mule deer app, uh, the, the gray light app. I just, that, and, and these, these aren't just to promote my rock slide business. This is because this, this is the stuff that fires me up. I, I like to learn from, from, from other people, you know, gray light, you know, Marlon, sure. Holden, you know, he's, he's done very well with a bow. I mean, that guy has done very well, man. I want to, I want to hear what that guy has to say. And, and, you know, and, and, and from a selfish standpoint, just because it helps me. And so to, to answer your question, it's, it's just the love of the hunt. I really love mule deer hunting and that that's what drives me on to want to be the, be the best and that I can be and learn the most that I can. Right. And you know what's weird about uh, hunting to me, Robbie, and, and I'm sure you have other hobbies in life, other things that you focus on and, and try to improve. One thing that's really interesting about hunting, because there's so many different variables, you know, the, it, you could like, well, this line, it could have been Robbie's goal is to kill 10, 200 inch deer in his lifetime, right? It could be like some defined nominal goal. And that's great. If that was the case, I'd be like, that's an incredible goal. More power to you. There's, you know, there's guys that have that goal. But the, the, the way you talk about it to me, it's that really all you want to do is know that you're getting better at it yourself. And hunting's weird that way because a lot of times there's so many other, you know, just exogenous variables out there, you know, where you're hunting, the tags you get, the strategy, you know, if you're, if, you know, if you've got disposable income to spend, there's all these different variables in the world of hunting. But the only person that's really going to know if you're improving is your, yourself. And it's, it's weird that way in terms of something that you're trying to get better at. Yeah. And, and, and to know if, if it was just about the numbers, um, it, it to, to me personally, I'm not saying that that's, that's a shallow pursuit. I'm not saying that at all. I love the numbers, sure. man. I, I can yeah, tell yeah. you what my, most of my books for, <laughs> but it, it, it's a little shallow for me because it's more than the numbers. It's, it's, it's the whole learning thing. And you, you just said it, you're the only one that can know if you're really getting better. Um, you know, I haven't slept in on a mule deer hunt, dude, for, for 20 years. Um, you know, we're in my twenties, you know, ah, I'm kind of tired this morning. I'm not going to go out, you yeah. know, just, just, just learning stuff like that. Like, man, you're leaving, you're leaving, a, you know, one of your hunting days on the table, dude, it could happen this morning, you know, get your butt out of bed. It doesn't matter. It's nine below in the tent. You got to go. You know, yeah. and, and so I've just gotten, and I shouldn't say I've never slept and I probably have, but I'm just saying that that, yeah. that was just kind of one area where I'm like, no, no, I got to get better at this. And then, you know, just, just those things I wrote about in the first book is your number one technique is, is it's definitely glassing. You know, I think that's what we all love about mule deer, but man, if, if that's all it is, um, you're going to have some long, boring days. And I've killed a lot of my big bucks by, by getting off of the glass, you know, and get, getting in the cover and getting, getting close to them. And, and that's the other thing too, is a lot of guys are surprised to find, you know, my average shots, like a couple hundred yards, you know, maybe sure. 250 and, you know, all the way down to, to 30 yards. And, and, and so that kind of stuff, as you're picking it up over the years, you're, you're, you're it's quantifiable in your brain that, Hey, I didn't used to be able to do this and now I can, I know I'm getting better. Right. And that, that's right. kind of what keeps pushing me on. And, you know, that's just a couple small examples there, but you know, there's, there's, there's been many, many things. My perseverance has gotten better over the years and man, it was just tested these last couple of years. In fact, the book you bought last night, the very last chapter is called the slump. Okay. That, that was written in January of last year. So there's only been one season since that, that was written. And, and I finally did, did punch a tag on a good buck. And right. that, that slump was a test, man. And it was hard. It, it's because I don't want to make it sound like, oh yeah, I, you know, it's not about getting a big buck, you know, it's about the pursuit. Well, of course it's about getting a big buck, man. If I never <laughs> get a big buck, you know, what, what yeah. am I doing? Yeah. You know, sure. but, but it, it, it was a test in the sense of, I, I really, I really had to, 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 
to know I was a, a, a perseverant person, if that's a word, that, yeah. that, 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 you know, that has paid off in the past. And, and this was the biggest slump I've had since 97. I mean, that, that was, that's a long time of being, being really successful at it. And then all of a sudden, man, nothing is going right. And, um, but it was the love of it that kept pushing me on. And, 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 and I'll, I'll tell you, I'm a better deer hunter right now than I was a year ago. And that's, that's success to me. Yeah, no, I hear you. And on that, um, in, and we don't have to delve in it for, for the, the whole podcast, Robbie, but it, you know, when you reflect on that slump, is there, do you feel like it was just, just a lot of it was luck, the tags you had, or were, were there mis big mistakes you made? Or, it, you know, where, wh what was the, the source of the slump from your perspective? Um, well, I'm a, I, I'm a God fearing man. And I think God lets things happen to us to, sure. to say, Hey, where's your heart really at? Um, you know, is this, is deer hunting your idol or is it just something you love to do? And if it's your idol, you're, you're going to be way down in the mouth when you're not doing well about it and doing well with it. And, you know, that's just my personal conviction that God's, he's blessed me. I've, I've, you know, I've had, you know, 35 years of, of, of hunting mule deer, which I love, but a little bit of it was just like showing where my allegiance was. And, and, and during that time, I just had to say, Lord, if I never tag another one, you're still number one in my life. That that's really what yeah. it was. Probably not what you, the answer you expected, but backing up a little bit all the mechanics of the slump well <laughs> you're gonna see i wounded a real good buck um in that story and i missed a real good buck and um had chances at other good bucks it just didn't come together i mean okay missing yeah. that's my fault uh wounding that's my fault um, but I've never had a three year streak where that just kept happening and happening. Um, sure. you had mentioned, mentioned the tags. Well, yeah, 15 years ago, you could get better tags, but you know, I'm still finding upper age class bucks every year. I have to work harder for it. So, you know, maybe if it was 15 years ago, I would have just had more chances and the slump wouldn't have lasted so, so long. So yeah, that, that's probably part of it, but um, it was such a painful slump because I had so many, I was so close. I mean, that buck I wounded last year, I mean, sure. he, he grossed in the one nineties. I mean, th that's a good buck by today's standard. That's a good yeah. buck by any day's standard. Yeah, I mean, they're, sure. they're, they're hard to find and, you know, to have one at 34 yards and then, and then, you know, wound him. This was with archery, obviously. Sure. Um, oh man, that is like, you're just grasping the golden ring and it gets ripped out of your hand. And mentally you have to, you have to deal with that. And that's why I bring up the Lord. I can't get all down in the mouth and like, Oh, poor, poor me. And my luck sucks. And you know, why does this always happen to me? And of course, you know, I'm human. I'm, I'm doing a little bit of that, but then I'm like, no, 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 no. This is more than the numbers. This is more than the, the deer hunting is not my idol. Deer hunting is a pastime. The Lord has given me that's blessed me richly and deeply. It's blessed my family. It's it, there, there's so much more to it. And I, I, I got to take the bad with the good. That, that's probably what I was trying to say earlier. Yeah, yeah sure. I got to take the bad with the good. And so when I wrote that story, the slump, I was just trying to, trying to just mentally process that, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to keep working the working it. I'm just going to keep working it. If I never get another one, it's okay. I'm just going to keep working it. But I do happen to know that if you work the process and you stick with it, and I studied other athletes, professional athletes the last couple of years who've gone through slumps because, you know, most do. And yeah. that's what they all said is you, you just got to do what, what you know is right. You got to keep doing what you know works until you know it doesn't work anymore. You know, T Tiger Woods, man, he he changed he changed his golf swing. Oh, back in the a long time ago in the two thousands, and um, like change and, and I didn't quite understand it because I'm not a golfer, um, but you know he 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 changed the mechanics of his swing, and as I read about that, it was almost like saying, you know, I've been a left eye dominant right handed shooter my whole life, and. And I'm going to, I'm going to switch to a left-handed rifle because it is ultimately going to make me better. 
because, you know, now I'm using my dominant eye to shoot. I can shoot with both eyes open. I get the depth perception. I might see something out of my right eye that um, I couldn't see before because I had to, you know, when I was shooting the other hand, I had to close my left eye. I hope, I hope I'm not confusing everybody, but that was the equivalent to what he did. And it was right. because he figured out this is going to make me a better golfer. What I was doing was not working. And so that was a little bit of going through the slump too, was kind of just at looking at everything that I'm doing. Like, do I need to change something? Has something changed? And ultimately it, it, it hadn't, there wasn't really anything for me to change other than just put on your big boy shorts and get out there. And it, it and, and you may go 40, 50, dude, I went 120 days without pun hunting days, um, yeah. um, without punching a tag and, 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 but I, I never could other than there was one thing I look at my shooting. I shouldn't be wounding a buck at 34 yards. That shouldn't be happening, especially when I've killed multiple big bucks with my bow. I, I shouldn't, that shouldn't be happening. And, 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 and ultimately that was just me not taking that extra one second and and making up my mind that i'd rather this deer get away without a scratch than not make a killing shot that's that's ultimately what and that story right. you're going to read the slump that that's ultimately what i've had to deal with and and so anyways i'm going on and on like i, no, no, I, I mean i think it's <laughs> i well you hit a bunch of really cool points in there robbie like like one is you're saying that, you know, it, it didn't work out this way, but you were smart enough to consider that you might have to take a step back before you were able to take three or four, you know, the next three or four steps forward mm -hmm. as a hunter and that, that, you know, kind of the Tiger Woods analogy there. And I think that's a good one, man. Like, um, and, and just to talk about it a little bit more, I think I'm, I'm guessing Robbie that, you know, one thing that might've been a little trying for you during this slump is that you're well known in the, you know, the deer hunting <laughs> community, right? Yes. And it's, so there's yep. more pressure, right? Like, yep. and I, I think that probably that's very obvious in your situation, but I think with all the social media and everything else, I think it's, you know, you could be a guy who, you know, you, you're, you're not a public figure in the hunting world, but you've got Instagram and your buddies do, and you, you're the guy who everybody used to think always killed the big deer in the community and you mm -hmm. haven't killed one in a couple years. Like you can't. I think anybody would be lying if they'd say that there's not more pressure, right? Because of that. Yes. And, and I don't know if that's good, bad or whatever, but it sure as heck makes it harder to like reassess what you're doing. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like you, mm -hmm. like, like this last year for me, I was, I had sold a business and stuff. So I had other stuff going on in life, but it was really hard for me to go to a new area and go elk hunting. Because I was mm -hmm. like, oh, it's, I'm not like, yeah. I'm going to have a much lower chance of killing, you know, killing something. And then it's like weird. And so it's so funny because it's hard, man. Like, yeah. I, and I think that's part of the process of learning, man. Like you got to get over that and just realize like, that's part of it. You, you might have to take a couple steps back before you, before you launch forward, you know? So I, I think that's a good point. And then the other stuff you hit on, man, like there's, there's so many variables in hunting and that's what probably makes it addicting and also makes it, you know, misery at times, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm glad you brought up the part about the external pressure of, you know, being known for doing something. And, you know, we all know people that have succumbed to that and made, made bad choices. Um, you know, I mentioned one of those names at the beginning of the podcast sure. and, um, um, and of course I feel that pressure. A absolutely. But that was something I kind of had to process that, you know, that's a self-imposed pressure. There's not, you know, the mule deer scoring police that are going to show up at your yeah. house and say, Hey dude, what did your buck score? You know? Oh man, you know, you're, 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 you're not cutting it here. No, no, yeah, that's yeah, all in yeah. your mind. And, and, you know, yeah, dude, like every day, especially after I wrote that story, the slump and, you know, readers read that and they're like, Whoa, dude, I guess I didn't realize you hadn't got one in a couple of years. And so I had a lot of people checking on me. 
which was <laughs> nice, but yeah. it was still pressure. It was still pressure. And, and that was something I kind of had to come to terms with. And that, that's why you heard me say it. <laughs> I just told the Lord, if I never get another one, you're still number one. That's what right. I had to resolve in my mind because then I could divorce myself from all that pressure, even though that's not intended pressure from people, right. because I had to get back to the basics of, no, I'm doing this because I love it. And, it. and it's just a blessing in my life. And it always has been. And, and it really is, even when I'm failing, it, it's still, you know, not every day do you love it, but it's still like, hey, man, I'm, I'm lucky to get to go. And so, so, so yeah, I, ha I had to think through that and, and not take any shortcuts. And we, we, we've all heard of guys that have, man, I, I don't want to do that. But that temptation sure. was there. Don't think for a second, you know, it wasn't there. Um, but, but, you know, coming out the other end now, I, 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 I think I grew a little bit in that time of, you know, this is not about showing off or look at me, even though I'm human. And of course, there's yeah. always that going on. Of course, there's always that going on. Sure. Jeez, if, I'd be a liar if I didn't say that. But there's yeah. so much more to it for me than than just that. And that's that, that's why I'm glad I went I went through the slump and I didn't give up. It made me a better deer hunter. That, that's what I mean when I say I'm a better deer hunter now than I was a year ago because I, I had to experience even that pressure of, man, there's a lot of people that kind of expect this from me. Right. Well, I, I mean, the other thing you hit on, Robbie, is just, to me, is just, and I, it, it is something that I think a lot of newer mule deer hunters or guys that have been at it for three or four years don't realize is you kind of hit on the, the underlying numbers. Like these big deer, like a true 190 inch mule deer, a 200 inch mule deer, like they are very rare just on the landscape. Just so mm -hmm. just st statistically, you've got to figure that out first just to mm -hmm. have a mere chance. And mm -hmm. then you've got all the other variables that go on there. So when you're talking, you know, somebody that knows what they're doing spent north of a hundred days of hunting for a yep. lot of people in normal day-to-day -day life, that's 20 years of hunting. You know what I mean? Or that's, you know, that's, that's yeah. a, a decade of hunting, a decade and a half on whatever it is. And so you can't, get down on yourself that you don't have a 200 inch deer, you know, or, or whatever, because it's, it, it, in the end, it, even if you're being pretty optimal about it, the statistics are the statistics. I mean, these individuals and you know, that like, like you, Robbie, that have a few huge deer, you know, and just, I mean, if a guy's got five, 200 inch deer in his lifetime, like that is a statistical, uh, ama it's amazing. And I think it's yeah. way underplayed because you all, because everybody sees underplayed is not the word it's, it's way underestimated because everybody sees the big deer, you know what I mean? That, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in, in media. So, so man, that like, I think is it for me, I think about that myself, like how many deer, you know, it, it really takes to see in order to, to, to find one of these huge deer, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and it, you know, it is harder now than it used to be. And, 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 and one of the dynamics I went through during this slump is, you know, I live in Southeast Idaho. It's, you know, mostly OTC. Um, you know, I hunt other States too. In that, in that time I had some Colorado tags, I had a Wyoming tag, I had a Nevada tag. I mean, I, I, I had other States, but sure. just about everywhere I went except for Colorado really suffered from that 16, 17 winter. And I know Colorado got some of that, but you know, we got the brunt of it, yeah. um, on the, you know, on the continental divide, basically from, you know, Southwest Montana down through, you know, into Southern Wyoming. That's where the, you know, that's where the 200, 220% snowpack was. And I'm not talking on December 15th, I'm talking on, you know, March 31st. I mean, that's mm -hmm. when it counts. you like, that's a yeah. lot of snow. And, and so, um, opportunities were seriously impacted for big deer. We lost that fawn crop. All right. So that means by 2021, when we should have, you know, a fawn crop of four and five-year-old bucks coming up, they're, they're gone. They're, you're missing a complete age class. Plus it took out all the upper age, you know, older, you know, old bucks. I don't want to say upper, but you know, the, the, you know, the, the grandpas, you know, they got wiped out and, you know, all you're left with is, you know, your does and a few prime age bucks after those hard winters. And dude, it was slim pickings in a lot of the places that I went. Deer numbers, 
you know, they rebound, rebounded, you know, fairly well because after those hard winters, the, you know, the, the next year, not that spring of when they die, but the next year, you know, those does have enjoyed a, a wet, you know, there's typically a wet summer. That's one of the good things about a hard winter. You got good soil moisture. The plants sure. rebound quickly. I mean, there's a reason this stuff happens. And, um, and, and, and so your, the deer numbers started to come back. Yeah. As soon as 2000, you know, 18, but man, there was a lot less big bucks around and that was part of it too. And you just have to learn. To, and I tried to get out of it. You know, I tried to, I tried to hunt other places, but you know, you don't know those places like you do, you know, right. where you grew up. And, and so that was, that was part of it too. Um, um, you know, you know, you had mentioned other things that might've impacted it. Definitely the hard winter had an effect on me. Sure. Um, and so got to, got to throw that in there as well. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, um, just so people, uh, I think this is a good, a good point when people talk about, you know, winter kill and that sort of thing. Uh, Robbie delve into the, when it matters. I mean, re cause really, I think there's this perception that these deer are dying in the winter. That's, that's, mm -hmm. that's typically not correct. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're dying in the spring. Is that, is that, is that what you were saying with the March deal? Yeah. Yeah. So when, if you like, I've got the, um, the snow packs pulled up for Idaho and Colorado right now. And, um, the, the way that the meteorologists report snowpack, it's, um, the number that we look at is, uh, snow water equivalent SWE, uh, percent of normal is what you look at. And, and that, um, is, will be a number, uh, let's just look at the Yampa and, 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 and White River Valleys uh, in northwestern Colorado. 140% um, of snow water equivalent is what's on the ground right now. So that's through today or through yesterday. All right. Mm -hmm. So that means compared to the 30 year average, there's 140% of normal on the ground right now. Now, if it doesn't snow the rest of the winter, that number's not going to stay at 140 because it's calculated on a daily basis. And so we statistically are going to get snow between now and um, I think uh, they, they calculate this through April. We're going to get snow. Well, if you don't get any snow, that's not going to stay at 140. It's going to drop. Heck, if it doesn't snow anymore, that that might be 80% of, of normal. Right. And so so when you're looking at those numbers, um, the, the later in the in the year you get, the higher those numbers stay that's when it hurts you. So like in the, the, the water year starts in October, you might get one big snowstorm and pull up this graph and go, oh my gosh, we're at 200% of normal. Yeah, right. for that day you are. Sure. Um, but if it doesn't snow the rest of the winter, that could end up being a great winter for the deer. Um, and so, yeah, it m matters how much snow is on the ground. Basically from about right now on is when I start to get worried. Yeah. Um, because even if it start kind of starts to lighten up right now, there's still a lot of snow out there. Um, and you know, I'm looking at a bunch of a bunch of everything west of I-25 right now in Colorado is the lowest basin is the Colorado headwaters, kind of some of your country over there. Yeah. Um, and it's at 130. Everything else is in the 140s. Um, yeah. And, and you got to get clear out onto the plains before it drops. And then, you know, looking at Idaho. And uh, Western Wyoming, you know, we're in the we're in the 140s as well, especially in extreme southeast Idaho, which would count um, uh, north northern Utah, uh, the kind of that triple point of Utah, Idaho, Colorado, uh, Wyoming. Excuse me, Idaho, um, Utah, and Wyoming are all going to be in that 140. Well, hey, that corner just happens to. Uh, winter about 50 to 70,000 deer, depending on how you count it. And <laughs> those are tough conditions. And right. even if it kind of stops right now, um, you know, we're, we're late enough in the winter, it's going to hurt. We're going to at least yeah. lose some, some, some younger age classes. So that's your money in the bank for, you know, if you're a big buck hunter, you know, you're looking out five years from now, mm -hmm. you know, the, all the fawns that were born in, 2022 last may there's going to be a lot less of them around i think we can safely say that and so 2027 there's going to be a a, a a gap yeah and and then if this continues we're going to start eating into our um our adults typically most biologists will say your bucks come next 
um, it's your does that, you know, they're, they're, they, they seem to be the hardiest for whatever reason, you know, no, maybe the rut isn't so hard on them. I, I, for whatever, it doesn't matter. It just seems like sure. that, you know, your does are kind of the last to go, but if, um, it, it's a little dicey right now. I mean, yeah, it's, sure. it's right there. And so, but, but you're right. I've been out on the winter range two or three days a week, just glassing. Um, you know, have, you probably saw my post this week, man. I'm telling people, man, just leave the sheds alone. Don't go run these deer around. It is so hard on them right now in a winter like this to be pushing them around. Um, but as, as I've been glassing and stuff, I, I'm, I'm not seeing any sick deer, you know, they're, oh man, that one's going to tip over tonight. I'm not seeing right. any of that yet. Um, but to your point, no, they're, they're eating their fat reserves up right now. And if it don't break here pretty soon, a lot of those deer, they're going to start tipping over around green up, um, you know, late March, early April. Um, a good biologist told me once, I wish I'd remembered his name, um, that, that deer have about 90 days of winter range on their back. Yeah, um, as long as they had a good summer and, and, and the good thing is, is a lot of these ranges did have a decent summer. I know, especially down into Colorado, you know, had a real good summer as far as moisture. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they, we could safely say a lot of these deer have 90 days of winter range on their back. And, and so if, if they hit the winter range and around here, they did, they were on winter range mm, two to four weeks early. So a lot of seeing a lot of deer on winter range by November 15th. So that's what, uh, December 15th. January 15th, February 15th, their fat reserves are, are getting down there. Yeah. And sure. uh, the only thing that's going to equalize that is available browse, good conditions. And then, you know, then they can kind of keep, keep pulling through until, you know, we start to get green up in, you know, March and April, but if they're out of it, and that's what happened in 16. They were out of it. 16 was kind of funny, if you, if you remember. Um, it actually did break in February. About February 10th, so we got a big warm-up. Um, and we, I mean, we we went from two or three feet of snow on some of these winter ranges that I was talking about along the Continental Divide there to bare ground in a lot. I mean, bearing ground, not like sure. totally bare, but, you know, like yeah. they could get back down to the feed. And I yeah. was like, awesome we're, we're gonna make it we still didn't it was just too long too of a winter it was just too intense and 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 you know I, like it always is even with the biologists i'm not picking on them but it seems like we'll say hey th this is a bad winter but then a couple of years later we look back and we go oh that was a really bad winter you know i, yeah. I think it's just you get more data in you know the, the the hunter success rates come in you know and and that's what we saw was by, you know, spring of 17 into spring of 18, it was like, that was bad. That was really bad. So, so anyways, the whole 90 days, um, we're coming up on that here pretty soon. And, and we, we need some improving conditions or, you know, we're going to take another hit and yeah. that's just how it is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting, Robbie, because like you mentioned, uh, you know, within the context of this discussion, the, the shed, the shed antler deal and you guys don't have a season there right the people can pick up sheds now they can the only thing idaho has is some very small uh, uh closures to human entry just a few of our winter ranges and dude we're just talking you know a yes, few square miles in some awesome. cases and and those are awesome they really are but that still leaves just massive amounts of country where where um there's no season at all you can just right. go in there and, and pick them up and man it's interesting to me uh, from you know just and i'm really reflecting more on like the vale valley and that you know the uh -huh. the areas that i've spent a lot of time in um up there you know the it'd be like the southeast side of the flat tops the you know the the uh colorado river corridor kind of stuff in mm -hmm. that area and one thing that's interesting to me is like there is a there is a shed a season and i think you know in these type of conditions um i actually talked to some guy because i haven't been in that area in the last couple months but i talked to some buddies a few a few days back and they actually said that you know just just in that specific area you know that the you know the eagle vale avon area you know all uh -huh. that stuff that the winter's actually not too bad right now um mm -hmm. but but anyways uh back to this conversation what's interesting in that area is you you've got the you know, guys that want to pick up antlers, but you also have all this other activity because a lot of the, the low country, just every year, there's more and more people, more development. And there's also more development of, of uh, just activities, you know, people on, on 
you know, snow bikes and just lots of new stuff. And what's interesting is what you hit on with this winter deal is I think a lot of people see the wildlife this time of year, you know, even if they're standing in two feet of snow, they still look pretty good. Yeah. You know, I mean, they, they don't look yep. bad, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they don't mind the fact that their dog, you know, just chased 20 does 500 yards, right? They don't yeah. really think they're having an impact, yeah. but what happens at least in that area, and I have to kind of reflect there and, and you can tell me if the areas that you spend a lot of time in are similar, what happens is, you know, stuff gets worn down and it, it actually tends to die in like winter kill there once it's once the mule deer start to move so they kind of move away uh, to the extent they can you know fall in green up fall in the snow line mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then they die kind of at and they you know they struggle and die kind of out of sight a lot of the time um so there's a weird there's this weird perception thing you know i think i think people would be much more careful of wildlife if it looked like it was struggling this whole discussion is a little bit of a challenge because there's this there's this this kind of misinterpreted perception that everything looks healthy. You know what I mean? But it, so just, just a thought, it, I think, I think it makes it hard sometimes for them to like regulate other activities and stuff. Cause people who aren't hunters are like, well, they look fine, you know? Oh, you're spot on, man. And I'm glad you bring that up. And, you know, I had a, had that conversation with a, with a very good mule deer hunter from around here who I totally respect uh, back in 2017, which was you know, the spring of 17 when, when we just knew we got our butts handed to us. And uh, he's a big time shed hunter. And he was like, Hey, I don't think it's that bad. We, you know, he says, I've been all over the winter range. He picked up a lot of sheds. He, he says, I didn't find that many deadheads, you know, hardly, hardly any any um uh, other age classes did i did i find out there and i was like uh yeah, let's just see what happens in a year well the next year he was that that fall he was like wow what a difference man there's hardly any bucks compared to where where we had it where do you think they all why didn't we find them on the winter range and and that's what I thought right there. What you said is, well, they don't all die on the winter range. You know, right. they die during a lot of biologists say they die during green up. It's whenever they're switching from, you know, the woody brows to the growing plants, you know, that's apparently very hard on them. And so they may be miles from the winter range. I mean, even a mile from the winter range, you're not going to find them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. And so, yeah, yeah, I've actually, I've, I've, I've witnessed that and I've, I've, I've discussed that with, with better deer hunters than me. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting and it's, uh, it's for sure a management challenge for, for folks. Um, just to, uh, I'm going to switch topics a little bit here, Robbie, and just, just to, I know that a lot of Jay's audience, uh, of the podcast here, they're going to have some experience mule deer hunting and there's going to be folks that are totally new to it or they're hunters who have elk hunted or whatever, but they got the mule deer bug. What, huh? what would be your just to it, somebody new into it and, and somebody's like, Hey, I'm going to spend the next five, six years, 10 years, you know, trying to hunt big mule deer. Uh, okay. do you have like a, what, what would the, what, what the, what's the path you would lay out to them in terms of advice? And, and we can talk about draw strategy, uh, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Well, Hey, the first thing I would do, um, is spend 35 bucks and go jo join the mule deer foundation. Um, because we want to make sure that you have five years to hunt mule deer and, um, you know, they're not a perfect organization, but they, they do a lot of good stuff for mule deer, regenerating winter range, um, you know, making fence crossings safer. I mean, they're just, the list is endless on what, sure. what they do for mule deer. And so I just throw that in there because as a young man, you know, I joined them, but then I kind of let it go for a few years. I don't know, probably just more out of laziness than anything, just, just didn't renew. And, and, and I regret that now they, they need the help and they, they do a lot of, a lot of good stuff for Mule Deer and they send you a killer magazine. You get it four times a year and that just reading that magazine will make you a better Mule Deer hunter because a better Mule Deer hunter will understand Mule Deer biology and ecology. And there's a lot of good stuff in that magazine. It's not just grip and grins. It's there's, there's some of that. Um, but it's, um, got some writers in there that, um, I can never say his last name. Sorry, Jim, Jim Heffelfinger, I think is how you say it. Oh, um, I, yeah, uh, I can't pronounce it either, man. Yeah. Sorry. Jim, we, all you know we all know you're, it's, it's, what is it? Deer. It, he goes by deer. Deer, deer nut. nut. Is that? Yeah. Okay. 
yeah, deer, deer nut. Yeah. And, uh, um, he writes a column in there, super, super informative. I mean, covering all, all mule deer habitats from desert to, to, uh, Alpine. Um, so there's a lot in there. So anyways, do that. Okay. And then, um, I would lean back on some of the advice I gave in my, um, my first book is that, hunt the mule deer hunt the mule deer country that's closest to you so if you're lucky enough to live in a western state don't get you know non-resonant itis thinking man i you know i live in montana and there's mule deer suck so i'm gonna go hunt in idaho um or hey i live in idaho i'm gonna go hunt in colorado that's all fine once once you got your foundation you'll you'll, you'll make good use of those days because you'll be able to show up in a unit hundreds of miles from you um, and you'll have a good enough foundation to be able to break it down and go, okay, I need to hunt here, ignore this. This looks good over here. You know, you, you'll, you'll know what you're looking for. Or if you're pretty new to the game, you, you need, you need to, to get a good foundation under you on, uh, you know, maybe a hundred days of, of, different habitats um you know because we hunt them different in the desert than we do in the in the in the foothill than we do in the subalpine than we do in the alpine and i just see guys that start running and i was one of them running around you know trying to hit this you know best of unit somewhere that they just don't even know what they're doing. You know, they would, if, even if they had enough points to draw a 20 point unit, they're not going to do it justice. And I don't care how much time you spend on Google earth and how many time you call the hunting consultants. You just, you just are not going to have a good working knowledge of what to do. And, and, and part of that working knowledge is confidence. And I'm not talking arrogance. I'm talking confidence. And, you know, this, this little slump we talked about, you know, I stuck it out on some pretty tough hunts um, the last three years, because I had the confidence to know, I, I know what I'm doing here and, and I just need things to work out. And, you know, I ended up being the only guy on the mountain in a lot of those hunts, you know, and, and started yeah. off with lots of guys on the mountain. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And so you, you kind of learn that perseverance in, um, in your early years of, of just continuing to hunt an area that you're pretty familiar with and get familiar with it and kind of learn what to expect, you know, make, make some decisions. Sometimes they're going to work out. They're not going to, but you're just a more efficient hunter when you're hunting closer to home. Okay. Um, you know, Idaho has a two week season. So if you're, you know, if you're only hunting Idaho for three days because, well, Hey, I grew up here and I, I see this a lot. I used to kind of think this and, you know, what we suck, you know, and it's not as good. It, it's the whole human condition of the grass is always greener somewhere else. Right. And so, you know, you're, you're putting in for all these draw tags in nine other States and man, you, you pull a Nevada tag and, Oh man, Nevada's all draw. This is going to be awesome. And, you know, I'm going to spend my whole summer scouting down there and, you know, you, you're, you're going to be down there every weekend and, you know, all that stuff. That's all fine. I'm not, I'm not against that, but at the end of the year, you're probably going to look back and go, wow, I actually saw better bucks up on the old back 40 here where I used to hunt. Well, it's because you, you kind of know where to go and where to be at daylight and where to be at dark and how to get in there without making a bunch of noise. And, you know, you got to Nevada and you were like, whoa, I didn't realize there was 150 tree elk tags open at the same time and a depredation antelope hunt, you know, and man, when I was down here this summer, there was, you know, I could have camped anywhere now, you know, I'm stuck in this little pullout you know, I mean, just all that stuff wears yeah, on sure. you. You know what I mean? And so if, 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 if you're hunting closer to home, you can recover faster. You know, you, it's not like, man, well, I wanted to come back next weekend, but you know, it's an 800 mile drive round trip. You know, that stuff's all easy to plan in January. I find when October rolls around it, 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 it you always end up pairing back your plans, you know, cause, cause life happens, you know I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, your kid falls off the trampoline and breaks his arm and you got to stay home, whatever. Um, and so, so get a good foundation or, and, and, and that's usually closer to home. Now, if you don't live in a mule deer state, then obviously that's going to, um, um, in, incorporate some travel, but you still need to be efficient about that. The, there's a story in that first book. You might even remember it. It wasn't really a story. It was more of a mention, um, that as I the book I, I had learned about a guy that killed a 40 inch buck in nebraska now now, now cliff you happen to you know guide and hunt um in some of the best mule country in the in in the world 
How many 40 inch bucks, legitimate 40 inch bucks did you ever see in that time? I remember one as a little kid at the post office. <laughs> at the post office. There you go. Dude, that, was, well, that, was, that was back was when a... if somebody killed one like that, they sat at the post office for about a week showing it to everybody. You know what I mean? I see. Um, gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So some of the best, the best mule deer uh, country on the continent. Um, was this in the 80s? Yeah, would have been. Would have been. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, the 80s, yeah, you know, 80s, the 80s weren't the 60s. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, the 80s weren't the 60s, but they were still pretty dang good. Yeah. All right. So you saw one. Dude, I've never, I've never seen one still. About 37 is about the biggest I've ever seen. Well, dude, a guy killed a 40 incher in Nebraska. Um, the year I was writing that book and, you know, I gathered a little bit of information on it and everything, and it didn't sound like anything real special, you know, like a draw tag or anything like that. He just killed a 40 inch buck. And, and yeah. I, the reason I put it in the book is because, you know, I got guys from Maryland or, you know, may, maybe I shouldn't say Maryland, maybe the Midwest. And they're, they're like, Hey, I don't, don't have mule deer here, you know? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to Oregon or I'm going to Montana and I'm like, man, you're, 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 you're going right past two great opportunity states, you know, Colorado, um, uh, east, east, Eastern Wyoming. Oh yeah. But there's a lot of private and I'm like, Oh, come on, dude. You're, yeah. you're, you're selling yourself short. You're my whole point is don't drive through good mule deer country to get to country. That's no better. Okay. Yeah. Save that. Save those long drives for the for the really good draw tags, which I hate to break it to you guys. Those are going to get fewer and fewer and fewer. <laughs> those opportunities are kind of going away, and, you know. Um, uh, but save the long drives and the and the energy and all the money and it takes for travel, you know, to maybe hunt a little bit closer so that you can uh, you can do that. A, a common one I get, dude, is, is Texans. They'll get a hold of me and they'll be like, "Hey, man, we want to come up to Idaho and da 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 da." And I'm like. Dude, wh why are you driving right through Colorado to get up? Oh, Colorado. I've hunted Colorado. Oh, my God. You're so many people and blah. I'm like, well, what do you think it's like up here? Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, and, and, and I'm like, just, just look at the record book. Where have more been killed? I mean, so, so all I'm saying is just don't get romanticized. I'll sum it up with this. Don't get romanticized about stuff that's a long, long ways from you. If you could be more efficient somewhere else that big buck that i killed this year was yes it was located a long ways from me but it was just in an average place that i've been able to hunt it was the third time i've hunted it in 20 years and not that it takes that long to draw it's just many years i'm not even interested i might my calendar's not open but right. you know by, by killing that buck that was a culmination of of kind of learning the area well you can't do that you know efficiently um, as a new hunter, typically. And so, 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 yep. so just don't get the grasses greener. Um, next from there, um, you know, if you think about that, that kind of solves the whole, you know, where should I put in, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, how many States should I put, be putting in for? Well, first of all, you know, make sure that you're, you're, you're hunting efficiently, but, but yeah, I apply for out of state hunts. I think I'm applying for about four or five different States right now. It was up to 10, but you know, I pared that down so that I don't have any overlapping hunts. I used to not think about that too much because I was like, well, I, they're so hard to draw. What's the right. chances of overlapping? Well, it happens. And it happened yeah, oh, yeah. in 2020 and it was part of the slump. You know, my, I put my son in for a muzzleloader hunt and put me in for a, a, a late buck hunt and we both drew. And, you know, I couldn't not take the little guy deer hunting and that was all fine. It was great, but dude, it totally screwed my hunt up. You know, these were located hundreds of miles apart on, and, and in the same dates, I should have thought that through a little bit more. Yeah. Dude, um, I, that dynamic, ahead. Robbie, I, I think that that's, that it's not talked about enough, man. I mean, I, I've guided guys that drew a goat tag and a moose tag in the same year and what it did, it ruined both hunts for them. Because it was like <laughs> it was like stress, anxiety, like I gotta get this done and go to the next one. So I didn't mean to interrupt you, man, but I think it's a very no. good point. Like, cause you you can't view it as like, well, it's just a chance. It's like, well, yeah, plan so you maximize your chances. But man, if you draw them, it 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 literally ruins them. So you gotta be, you know, have some foresight on it. You know, I, I think it's a good piece of advice, man. Yeah, no, dude, please interrupt. That's one reason I was so excited to come on this podcast with you because I thought, man, I get to talk to somebody that's done this, knows this, and man, I want, I want to hear from <laughs> you too. But, the, but yeah, the, 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 probably something to add to that to make people aware is you are not going to have the passion and the energy and the drive come fall 
that you have, say, right now. And, and what I mean by that, you're, you're going to probably have it on opening day. And if you have a super tag, you're probably going to have it the first two days. <laughs> and yeah. then after that, you're going to be like digging into the energy reserves. And dude, I, I'm just, you know, I've been hunting mule deer 35 years, good health, you know, 54 years old, man. I'm, I mean, I'm ready, but yeah. I'm always surprised that I have a limited amount of mental energy once the season opens. I'm not talking physical energy. Go to Instagram. It's all physical. Hey, you know, look at my biceps. You know, yeah. I'm doing this. I'm running marathons. Hey, that's all great. That totally is great. You know, do, do all that stuff. But but that's not what's going to kill you big mule deer typically. Okay. It's, it's going to be, you've heard me say the word perseverance many times. It's, you're just going to have to persevere. And a lot of times you're just trying to overcome yourself. You're tired. That's why I talked about trying to hunt efficiently and closer. It is tiring to drive 800 miles and then, and, and then try to be fresh for a hunt. It, 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 and, and I realized, you know, and I do it. But that's sure. something you have to overcome. You know, you have to, once the newness wears off, that's when you got to dig deep. And so don't overestimate yourself. And I think sometimes when we apply for all these tags, we're overestimating what we can do. We, we really are. And man, the older I get, the more I'm, I'm like, you know what? I'd rather have one tag that I can throw myself into than, than three or four that I got to, that I got to spread myself thin on because I just don't hunt as well. I get tired. I get mentally oh, yeah. tired and, and, and it's hard. And, 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 and that's just part of the game. I'm not saying, you know, every day you're out there, you know, it's sunshines and roses and you should be smiling and you should be all charged up and you know, you're flying out of bed in the morning, man, no coffee for me. I don't need coffee, man. I'm going to the top. You know, it, it's not, I mean, it, it, it you're going to have those days, but there's a lot of days it's like, man, all I have seen is hunters. I can't get away from the hunters. You know what? And, and you just got to keep, you just got to keep digging. And, and, and it surprises me every year how fast I mentally run out of gas and I have to kind of reach in the tank. And, and, and that's why a lot of times uh, there's just so few people by the end of the season. That's, that's what's happened, you know? Yeah. And yeah. So, well, so keep that in mind. It's wild, Robbie, because that's my biggest, it, it sounds insane, but that's my biggest advice to newer hunters or even, you know, you know, people who have been at it for a while is just, if you got a five day hunt planned, just make sure that you hunt all five days. And it mm -hmm. sounds so, mm -hmm. it sounds so dumb when I say it, but mm -hmm. if you do that, you're literally in the top one third of hunters right off the bat. If you could yep. just, and it's easy, you know, it's easier said than done too. But like, if you could do that, man, it, it really does put you in the top one third. It does. It does. And I think, I think more guys are kind of figuring that out, but I'm still surprised at, you know, if you want to, if, if you don't like hunting Colorado, cause it's busy, just go the last five days of second season and, and you, you can tell oh, me yeah. I'm wrong. Or, I mean, it's yeah, there's still people, you, you know, the hardcore guys are there. But that's fine. The hardcore guys, you're, you're hardly ever you're ever competing with them. Right. You know, and and so if you're tired by day three and it just sucks and the weather's hot and you're just worn out. Well, I get it. I've had to tap out. I'm, I'm you know, I, yes. I get it. I'm just saying don't tap out because it's like, like well, I've got a Nevada tag next month. That's going to be better because that's yeah, what yeah. your mind will do to you. That's the tricks your mind will play on you. That's the oh, grass yeah. is greener syndrome right there. Like, you know, this, this one didn't work out. Well, I'm glad, you know, because I'm, I'm headed to this other tag and it's going to work out there. No, every one of them is going to have a whole set of challenges. And to me, mule deer hunting is a mental game. That's what keeps me, keeps me in it is, is if I can stay mentally strong, I can usually pull it off. Um, yeah. you know, very few hunts do I fail on because of the physical aspect of it. It's, it's the mental aspect. And, and so too much, just too much is what wears on me and, yeah, yeah. and, and just the way the draws work and everything, I'm probably always going to end up with more than I need because you can't, you know, you can't just say, well, I'm only going to put in for one tag, man. Well, yeah, yeah you got to, you know, one, you, yeah. I will be picking up golf because I, I won't be able to go hunting, Yeah, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so that's, but, but, but I really am careful. So that's the advice to your listeners to make sure I don't have overlapping hunts. And if it's an early season hunt, like that's going to be, you know, in, in, you know, August into early October, um, I want to make sure that my summer is open so that I can take advantage of trying to, and I always use the term pattern loosely to try to pattern 
pattern some bucks because there's you know a decent chance they're going to be pretty cl- they're going to stay on summer range i can say that yeah and there's they're, they're going to be pretty close to that and yeah but you know i've had two or three hunts lined up in between late august and early october and um and i screwed every one of them up because i didn't scout because i needed to save the days for the hunt you know what i mean and yeah. then also with one hunt you know i remember in one year colorado uh, muzzleloader was open september 8th i was like man i'm not gonna miss that you know that's still you know almost velvet mode for those bucks um well i ended up hunting in idaho on a big giant buck i found here a big giant buck and we're talking you know 215 you know we're talking a one in 10 year buck around here for me i hunted him right up to the day i left to colorado and um um and then went to colorado and I did, I did okay. I got a good buck down there, but he wasn't two fifteen. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I, and I lost the rest of my year on that Idaho buck I was chasing. I just, I think I found him once or twice, but it was just the, the not efficient, too far apart. And I was tired when I came home from Colorado, dude, I was so tired. I just, oh, yeah. I mean, I had hunted something like 17 out of 20 days and I just needed a rest and you know, gosh, I needed to see my kids. I needed to, you know, you, yeah, all that yeah, normal yeah, stuff yeah. that you think, oh, they'll just deal with it. Well, they might, but you won't. You'll be like, no, I, I want to see mama. I yeah, want to yeah, see yeah. my kids. You know, you go through all that. Well, dude, by the time I got back on that Idaho buck, he had moved some and, and, and I just, I just lost my opportunity. I would have been better off to turn that Colorado tag back and just, just stay on that right. Idaho buck. But because of these dynamics that I'm talking about, I, you know, I didn't plan well. I ended up with two tags at the same time and, and it hurt me. It hurt. It, yeah. it cost yeah. me the buck of a decade. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I hear you. You know, it, one thing and it popped in my head when you were, when you were saying that, that story in, in the, you know, the early season hunting, I, one thing I noticed about you, Robbie, and, and this is just my perception, watching social media, reading your books and you don't, you don't really, as far if I, I, Tell me if I don't remember this right, but you don't pound on it in in the books or anything. But I've noticed it is that you're a pretty flexible hunter, man. It's I mean, it sounds like you're open to hunting any season. You're open to backpacking. You're open to horses and mule packing. You're you're you have a lot of flexibility built into how you hunt deer. Is that it? it w- would you say that's true? And do you believe that gives you kind of an edge? Oh, you, you nailed it, bro. I, I will hunt with a bow, a muzzle loader, a rifle. I've killed big, big mule deer with all three types. Um, and it wasn't kind of one of those things that were, oh, I, I have a goal of getting a 200 inch deer with each weapon type. No, it wasn't that. It's like, no, man, I got to be in the field at times when I have a chance to kill a big buck. And so the weapon is secondary to that. And, right. you know, if you play your cards, right, you know, some of these, like, especially archery and some of the early muzzleloader, man, you're, you have an advantage being out there at that time. Um, you know, there's a reason there's not rifle seasons at that time. Um, for, for the most part, there are some draw hunts and everything. And so, yeah. so yeah, no, you gotta, you gotta be that flexible. I mean, I, 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 I'm not a, a stick bow hunter. Um, I cringe at the day they start offering great opportunities for stick bows. Um, and you know, maybe like Oregon has one hunt right now. I believe that it's stick bow only man. If yeah. that, if yeah. that m- model took off <laughs> and, oh, dude, I, you know, you, you know, you're going to have to pick it up. Dude, I'm going to be out there shooting 13 yards and missing the paper plate, you know, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but I would do it. I would do it if that's what it takes to, 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 you know, to land a tag and an opportunity, you bet. So, so yeah, yeah. man, I'm glad you picked up on that. It's just, and, and most of the really successful big mule deer hunters, I know they're, they're kind of the same way. It's, yeah. you know, Travis Hobbs, natural born hunter. He's the same way. It doesn't, you know, we don't even think about the weapon. We think about the opportunity it provides. Um, Brian Letourner that owns monstermuleys.com. Same thing. You know, yeah. you, you, you just got to hunt. There's not enough opportunities, I think, to, ju- to just be a rifle hunter. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's crazy, Robbie, because a lot of guys, not only do they, are they only focused on rifle hunting they they only want to hunt the third and fourth season, you know, in, in, mm-hmm. I'm talking mm-hmm. about Colorado, they want to hunt rut hunts. And yeah. that's like, like one of the biggest pieces of advice I would tell folks is that, I mean, hunting the rut's fun, man. I, I used to love, I mean, I'll be totally transparent about it. I used to love hunting the rut. Because we would kill big deer sometimes that I had never seen. I didn't know were yep. there. And yep. we just showed up and get, we got dumb luck. I, yep. And I'm not, I'm not crapping on anybody who has killed big deer during the rut. You know, they, there's a reason they're big 
whatever. But I'm just admitting to the fact that many of the big deer that I've been involved with were dumb luck during the rut. They're just yep. susceptible, right? Mm -hmm. But, yep. you know, the, the flip side of that is that you just don't get a – if that's your only focus, you're either going to hunt very marginal mule deer hunting areas or you're only going to hunt once a decade. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and that ain't gonna fly with me, man. And yeah. I, I, it's not. And, and you know, back to the strategy. It's not the strategy I would would give the listeners. You know, ten years ago, you could pick up a, a consultant magazine, and you know, it was just apply, apply, apply. Get your bonus points. You know, that's your investment in the future. A lot of those guys are kind of scratching their head now, like, well, that doesn't work anymore because yeah. you can't catch the draw units. And um, you know, you used to have to. Yeah, if you set out three or four years, you could pick it up a pretty decent tag. Now you got to sit out ten. So what? You're going to go on three mule deer hunts in your whole life. You're not even going to know what you're doing. You know that that's yeah. just not enough. I don't care how much. Go. You can read my books. You can read Kurt Darner's books. You can read Dwight Shoes mule deer stuff. Chuck Adams. Uh, get the Gray Light app. You can do all that kind of stuff, man. You ain't got enough confidence in the field to make decisions, and, and so right. so that's just not going to fly anymore. And you know. It, 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 Sidebar, if, it, if if we could go back to OTC Westwide with a cap, you know, so that we, you know, I'm not saying OTC unlimited, but, yeah. you know, where where um, we got rid of all, all the draw hunts unless there was just a special need for it to manage those those deer so they didn't sure. get overhunted, you know, kind of like it was in the 80s. And then you gave it five years. I think it would level out just fine. And, um, and, and, and we'd be better than where we're at right now because we've created all these draw opportunities that we can't access. And I'm guilty. I'm guilty. Yeah. When Idaho flip flop their deer and elk season says, we're taking the mule deer out of the rut. Uh, this was in 91. We're going to take the mule deer out of the rut. We're going to put it in October. We're going to have more big bucks and we're going to take the elk season. We're going to move it out of the rut. <coughs> Excuse me. These are for rifle seasons. <coughs> we're going to move it out of the rut. We're going to have more, more big bucks and we're going to have more big bulls. <clears throat> they were right, but you can't find them is the yeah. problem. That's the whole reason of moving it into October. Well, you can, but it's a lot harder. And I'm not saying we should go back to, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying we, we, the byproduct of all that is they created these late buck hunts which, you know, we're going to give you primo opportunity. Well, back when they created that model, there was a chance of drawing three or four or five in your lifetime. Oh sure. man, not now. They're, they're lower single digits draw odds for residents. Right. You know, we lot, we, we, we're, 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 we've entitled a very small percentage of, of people to go hunt a, a big buck on a late buck hunt. And by the way, half those guys get spanked. They still don't get a big buck. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, and, and, and we did that on the backs of thousands of days of OTC hunting. Um, you know, we took that away from people and, um, and lowered their opportunity so we can have a few more late big buck hunts. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm on my soapbox, but I'm like, I'm just saying it didn't work. It worked for a while, but it's yeah, not yeah. good now. If Idaho put up a proposal and said, hey, we're going to run general Idaho mule deer season from October 15th to November 5th, and it's just going to be OTC with a cap, you know, with a cap. I'm yeah. not saying just go kill them all. I'm not saying that. You know, maybe um, um, if they did that and then they said, and we're going to get rid of all late buck hunts, I would vote for it. It would it would it would equalize the playing field instead of just you know giving entitlement to the few people who are lucky enough to draw. And yeah, I've drawn some of those hunts, but I've still killed more bucks on these lower opportunity hunts that we're talking about. Um, I, I I would support that. I I really would. Yeah. Um, well, it's I, I mean, a, go ahead. You like the thing is, Robbie, is like you know the difference because you you've hunted them throughout the yeah. seasons. I mean, if I'm hunting mule deer on October fifteenth versus November fifteenth. It's literally a different species. Yep. <laughs> you know, I mean? like it's like, yep. and, and particularly the big ones. I mean, I, I, for how much time I spent in certain areas, how deer vanished in the last two weeks of, or, you know, mid, that mid October mm -hmm. chunk, or, you know, really yep. for us, like September 20th to October 20th, it was yep. like mind boggling to me, like, yep what happened? It, it's, it's so much harder. And, and we could get into a, a deeper conversation about this. What Colorado had these, has these big shifting dates, right? And, and part of the, part of the deal here is that, you know, like second, you know, second rifle and even third rifle, the quotas during those seasons were like, if you look at the tag numbers, they're crazy high. Like they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're a lot of tags. And then yeah. your fourth season, hunt 
would have would have maybe one tenth the tags as like yes. a second or la- whatever, and that made that made sense because they're literally they're so much easier to kill in the rut. Um, yep. Not to get off on a tangent, but one of the big problems is some of these big large quotas are really during partial rut now, right? So you've got that dynamic. Yeah. But <laughs> back to my original point, it is it is amazing how much more difficult it is to kill a big deer mid October versus versus November. Night and day. And so Idaho's season right now is October 10th through the 24th. That's the majority of it. And and that's saving us some bucks. I get it. But it's 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 really, really tough. It is, you know, unless you've got one scouted and you you uh, uh, pull a rabbit out of the hat the first couple of days, you know, it's just going to get harder and harder. Um, you know, I really t- because Idaho, I can hunt efficiently um, um, per, per my earlier points. You know, if it if, if the conditions get good again later in the season, I'm there. You know, I you know, if, if it snows, um, um, I'm there. You know, I can I can revisit the hunt is kind of what I'm getting at. You know, back to the whole draw strategy thing. If, if a person can not have to just put all their eggs in that five days, you know, if they've got a longer season, you know, take advantage of it. But, but yeah, if you're hunting mid October, it is tough, tough, tough. Now I will say there are some draw hunts with very few tags in the field and maybe they occur in really open country, maybe semi-desert coolie type country. Um, those can be really good in October. If there's, if, if there's an age class there and there usually there is an age class there, if it's a draw hunt, um, you, you know, because the bucks are, 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 living in more open country, you know, they're not going to move as much. You get to see that dynamic that you're talking about, but you know, when you're talking, you know, trying to hunt, you know, at 10,000 feet South of Monstros, Colorado, we'll go, go look at the, the deer country. That's at 10,000 feet. It, it, it's all trees. It's yeah, all yeah. brush. It's all, I mean, you, you know, they, they're, they're there, but you, but you can't access them. And so, so to the whole draw strategy thing, that was kind of the next thing I was going to tr- tr- throw in there is you, you study deer hunting enough that you know where you can be efficient and and then hunt those hunt those days and so colorado's uh we keep talking about colorado i don't want to send everybody there um but you know their second season's nine days that's a big chunk of time in there you don't even have to hunt the whole nine days if you came the last half of the season and hunted you know six or five sure you know you're you're, you're gonna you, you're, be a lot less people out there and um um, you know, you might be able to be more efficient than, you know, not having to just fight people and, you know, try to find country that doesn't have people in it and still have, you know, plenty of hunt for most guys. If they're new to mule deer hunting, five days is going to be a long old hunt for them. Right. Um, yeah. um, you know, especially if it's got a physical component to it, you know, hiking a lot and, you know, and you've, you've been around stock a lot. That's why I follow you on Instagram, by the way, great post yesterday on the horses versus mules thing. But, um, <laughs> even with stock, well, stock just means you're working your butt off when it's dark, you know, yeah, yeah, sure. and taking care of them, you know, you're doing all that stuff, but, but try to, try to work, uh, work your strong points is what I'm getting at. You know, look at your calendar, make sure you don't have conflicting hunts. Um, you know, if your strong point is hiking, then great. Maybe you can pick a unit where backpacking is going to make a little bit more sense. And, and, you know, backpacking th- a second season in Colorado, that takes a, you know, it, unless the weather's nice, you know, you're going to have some logistics there. You're going to have to solve, you know, probably need a, a, you know, a backpacking stove, you know, things like that. Um, and so, you know, have all that stuff worked out. Um, and so that you're hunting efficiently, don't sit at your computer in January and say, man, I'm hunting unit X in Wyoming and it's awesome. And, you know, I'm going to be there and you get there and you figure out, man, it's like, it's like six miles round trip just to get to my glassing point. Yeah. And yeah, maybe you're running, you know, marathons and everything, but that's still going to wear, that's still going to wear on you, especially when you get up and it's seven degrees, you know, that changes everything. Oh yeah. You know, your, your canteen is frozen. Your sandwich is frozen. You know, you, you just kind of have to work through all that stuff. And so if those things aren't your strong point, maybe you should be applying for an earlier season. Um, that, and maybe it's a primitive weapon season. Maybe you have to hunt with a bow or a muzzle Motor, you know, but, but be able to get your feet underneath you when you're not just battling weather. I mean, every hunt you're battling weather, but I'd rather battle weather in September than, than uh, late October, you know, and, and think about that stuff, you know, mule deer hunting is logistics and I'm talking everything from your boots to your truck, to your, to your, to your horses, it's all of that stuff. And so make sure that what you're applying for takes advantage of your strengths, um, that, that, that you have, you know, I'm, I'm getting older 
uh, uh, Cliff, I hurt my knee last year. I hurt it when I was 16, but I really hurt it last year. And so backpacking mule deer is probably off my plate now. It, yeah, it's going to, it would have to be a pretty short hunt. It would have to be something like, Hey, you know, this buck is just living a mile up on the BLM and you know, there's no really no reason to take a horse in that far. Okay. I could do that. Um, but, you know, the, the big stuff, no, it's going to have to be horses or nothing. I just ain't got enough cartilage left in my left knee to do it all. And so I'm playing my strengths now too. I'm looking yeah, at, sure. at, 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 you know, where, even some of the front range stuff that I hunt, I don't just mean front range of Colorado. I mean, the, you know, you got your back country and you got your front country. There's a lot of front country that's still one to four miles back in, you know, if you're 26, that's, that's nothing. But if you're mm -hmm. 54, it's like, I, I got to figure out how to use my horses in that country. And, and the, the, the buck I killed this year was on a front country hunt using horses maybe two and a half, three miles in oh, Okay, you know, far enough, far enough in that I'm still running into guys that are hiking, but they're not efficient. They're, yeah. they're getting there late. They're leaving early, you know, things like that, that kind of throw you a loop. You know, if you don't know your unit real well, where, you know, I can jump on a horse at six o'clock in the morning and I can be on the glassing knob at seven ten, exactly when I need to be. And I can, I can look at that Canyon for 30 minutes and you know what? He's not here this morning. I still have the logistical ability to get over there a mile away, which I know that's good to your country. This stuff right in between me and there, man, I can just blow through that. Um, um, and, and I can be over there and I can still be there by eight, eight, ten, and, and still have another good hour. And then after that, yeah, I'm going to have to figure out what am I doing? Am I switching over to steel hunting? You know, am I going back to camp and am I going to sit the day out here? What am I doing? You know, that's the kind of stuff I would tell your listeners, make sure you know your area well enough to have those logistics worked out. And, uh, you know, the only way you're going to be able to do that is hunt the same areas repeatedly or have some very generous friends that are going to say, yeah, dude, here, I'll share the on X point with you right here. This is where you need to be at this time. You know, don't, don't worry about this place at this time you know that that kind of stuff make make sure you're playing to your strengths yeah yeah i uh you hit on a bunch of good ones uh robbie and i'm gonna delve into one more topic with you and then i'm gonna let you go man so i don't take okay. take your whole your whole morning but that's it and that goes for all honey man the deal about just being able to hunt the same area multiple times or you know having your logistics figured out in certain areas on all mm -hmm. hunting i think that's way underestimated you know what mm -hmm. I mean? C consistent elk hunters, consistent deer hunters, that's at least part of their repertoire, right? Like they, they know some areas really well. That's, that's, mm -hmm. that's for sure a chunk of their, their, uh, their, their overall strategy. So the last topic I want to talk about, and you hit on it there a little bit was, was pack animals. And the way mm -hmm. you put it is exactly how I put it because pack animals are funny when you, when you talk to backpackers about it, a lot of them will say, well, I can, I can hike just as fast as you can on a horse or, or, you know, or there's such a pain in the butt to take care of in camp. And that's, that's true. But to me, pack animals are, if you're going to be in somewhere for seven or eight days, there's a difference, mm -hmm. at least for me and me, I'm just a weenie of staying in a backpack tent and cooking on my jet boil every night versus, you know, being able to pack in with animals and have a camp that I'm comfortable in for me. And I've spent a lot of time up in the mountains, man. And still there's a huge difference for me. I have way more longevity as a guide or hunter if I can pack more gear. And so that's, that's why I like pack animals, right? It's not, it's not about like a single, single day efficiency. Um, but mm -hmm. what, what, how do, how do you view it? And, and what are your thoughts on people, I guess, using pack animals? Well, um, you know, I, I grew up around it, so it was a little more natural for me. I know the barrier to entry is hard for pack animals. You know, if you didn't, if you don't have a mentor and, you know, property or stuff like that. Yeah, it, it, it's hard and it's almost not worth it unless you're using them a lot. I know a yeah. lot of guys yeah. that, that buy horses and try to get into hunting and they end up selling them. And they always say the same thing. It's like, man, so much work for a week of hunting. I'm yep. like, I get it. In fact, that's why I, I hunt th two or three months. It's I got to yeah. get my use yeah. out of my horses. And, and so I would never argue with those guys that say, Hey man, I'm just as efficient on my feet. I mean, dude, 
they're in a way, some they guys are more are, efficient yeah. on their feet. I'm, I'm with you. So, so it's all about trade-offs for me. And so this is how I would answer it. When, when, when Mike Eastman first coined the, the term coyoting out and, um, and then David Long kind of picked, picked up the torch and took it. And what they're talking about is <clears throat> early season mule deer, um, uh, in repeatable patterns and you, you, you know, you know where to be <clears throat> and you don't need to be anywhere else. So maybe you're staying on just the backside of a ridge and all you got to do is hike up to the top of the ridge and you got three basins you can look into and um, you can expect bucks to be there. Oh man, you don't want a horse for that. I get it. If, if right. it's, you know, if, if you, if you physically can hoof it up that Canyon six miles and climb that 2000 feet, you know, once you get through that, yep, you're having a better hunt than me. Cause man, I'm constantly worried. I mean, you, you, you think oh, humans yeah. worry about water, geez, horses, my goodness, five, yeah. 10 gallons a day. You know, you, you skip a day, you know, you, you, you twist a gut, you know, you put them in the hospital. I mean, there's a lot on the line taking care of a horse. So if it's an area that you can backpack into and you're physically able to do it, do it. Don't mess with the stock. I'm with you. All yep. right. But when you know, I'm 50, I'm, I'm almost 54 now, you know, those days are kind of winding down for me. That is not going to happen. As, as, as I said earlier, I just physically can't do it. It'll break me down too much. Yeah. Um, and so, um, I've got to lean more and more on horses. I'm going to be actually using horses where places where backpacking might be more efficient. All right? right. So, but again, I'm playing to my strengths or I'm not playing to my weakness, you know? Um, yeah. Um, but I would never argue with those guys that, 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 that are physically able to do that. That that's fine. But I will tell you this, I will tell you guys this, the back, you know, rock slide is, you know, hardcore backpacking background. So I, I talked to hundreds of them. Some of the best sure. backpack hunters in the world are on rock slide and these guys are awesome. And, 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 and every one of them is a physical specimen and <laughs> that's why they're good at yeah, it. Yeah, sure. Um, but outside of those guys, I don't want to call them wannabes, but let's just call them the, uh, the amateurs, you know, that they, they're, they're doing the pro stuff from an amateur angle. Those guys are gone when the conditions get tough and the, the weather gets cold. Um, you know, they, they may do fine for one to two to three days, but it's just so tough. And you yeah, said it, you know, just staying in a little backpacking tent when the weather gets inclement, um, you know, everything's frozen. You never can warm up. And then just dealing with your boots. I don't care what boots you buy. You know, you sweat in those boots. When you got freezing temperatures, you give it two or three days of that. You can't, you can't get your feet warm because your boots are wet. You know, right. that takes a wood burning stove to, to, to unthaw those. And so my, my whole point in that is in, in, once I get past October 15th, unless the weather's nice, I'm not competing with many backpack hunters. They're around yeah. and and they are more efficient. They can they can they can really hone in on an area better than I can. I'm loud, I'm noisy, I need to move the horses out, you know. I mean Yeah, sure. Dealing with all that stuff. Like I said, you know, when you're a horseman, you know, most of your work is at night. You know, I get it. Those guys come home and you know come back to the tent, they pop open a mountain house and you know, they're asleep by eight. Just you and yeah, me at eight o'clock, we're just getting started, man. Yeah. <laughs> I got to unsaddle him and oh crap, I think I threw a shoe. Geez, I need to put a boot on this horse. I mean, all that stuff. And, you know, and, 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 but it's my strength. I have to play to that strength. It's all I got now. I mean, when, when I was in this, this big buck I killed this year, dude, I had the only horse in the unit that I saw. I never saw another person. I think people drove by my camp and were like, man, what a lazy bastard, but yeah, <laughs> that's my strength. And, 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 and I just kind of learned it's, you know, if I'm not finding bucks by about nine, 10, 11 o'clock, I'm okay to jump on that horse and ride back to camp and, you know, get the horse fed and, um, you know, be back out three thirty, four o'clock and I can hit a totally different area. I'm okay to do all that. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I'm not, I'm not coyote now, like, like Mike Eastman on the knob and those guys stay there all day. That's efficient. That's great. That's great. If you can do it, do it. But for me, um, you know, horses have been, I say it in my first book, at least half of my success. And as I'm getting older, probably even more of my success. Well, that's, that's and, the thing, um, Robbie's like, well, one of my thoughts, man, about horses, because because I agree with your original point, and that's that I'm like you, man. I grew grew up around livestock, and I I it's almost irrational for somebody with no background 
unless they have just a strong, strong passion to get into pack animals. It, mm-hmm. It's if that's not the case, it's almost irrational for them to pursue them just for hunting. There's just it's just yeah. such a just such a extremely long and steep learning curve um, mm-hmm. that it's got to be it's got to be almost a separate passion to your hunting, and then and then it might make sense. <laughs> but but yeah. what what I was what I was gonna uh, get at, and I've I saw this over the years a lot up in the mountains is the one phenomenal thing about pack animals is i think they give a hunter more longevity like they're yes. co- like i think your career as a mule deer hunter will probably be you know who knows maybe twice as long as it would be if you were only a backpacker it, it's yep. just my opinion but nope, from what i've true. seen i mean i've seen i see guys you know up in the flat tops wilderness on horses who are 75 years old and i'm talking yep. way up in there and they're just riding in yep. there for the day but they're covering a lot of country and they've been mm-hmm. doing that since they were you know 25 years old yep yep you you nailed it dude and that's why i said you know my backpacking days are kind of coming to an end you know yeah if, if it's going to be more than a mile or two um i'm going to have to figure out I, I can hike that, but I can't hike that with a 70 pound pack or a 50 yeah. pound pack. Or, I just or, can't do or it. It's each hurting. day, each, each yeah. five days straight, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, this archery hunt that I hunted hunted this year, um, you know, I got on a big buck, dude. And dude, you can see this buck from the highway. Yeah. But because <laughs> of the because of the logistics of the private and everything, you no, know, it was about, I don't know mile and a half, two mile ride on a horse. You had to come in from the backside from another road. You, you, people don't even equate that road with hunting that country. Yeah. Um, and, and sure enough, a big old buck figured out nobody's in here. Well, dude, I, I, I rode that for seven days in a row because this other thing too, it was 95 degrees. You Ooh. just, and, and, and dude, we're talking sagebrush deer, no shade. Yeah. And so yeah. you couldn't, you couldn't camp back there. There's no water. You know, the deer were moving at night and watering on yeah. agriculture and then moving back up into the BLM um, during the day. And, and dude, I was like, I, you know, I could hike that mile and a half, no problem. But every single day, seven days in a row, nah, Frick, you're going to find me down at the hamburger stand about day three, you know, <laughs> looking for an, an air conditioner. I know what that's, what that's going to be, but because I had a horse with me, um, it was like, you know, I'm up at three o'clock in the morning, getting the horse ready, had to trailer him from the camp I was at to that road I was talking about, you know, I'm, I'm on these, I'm on these bucks every morning, you know, crack a light, you know, not even legal shooting light. I'm in position every day. And unless I had a stock, you could only stand the heat till about noon, 11 or noon. And, you know, after that, if you didn't see him bed, you know, you sit out there and get a great, um, a a great case, uh, skin cancer, but you're not going to see the bucks. And so that's fine. I pull out of there. The horse made it efficient. I pull out, go back to camp, get some shade. You know, I go out in the evening glass a little bit from the highway and look over there and, oh, okay. They they actually moved a Canyon during the day. If if I'd have been there, maybe I'd have got a stock, but probably not. So, but the next morning efficiency, man, I am there. I'm right there in the morning. And, and that's what stock has allowed me to do is like you said, extend my career, you know, cause I, I, I know I did that. That was all on my back. It, I wouldn't have been as efficient. I went with a guy this year that's about 35 year, years old, um, 40. He's just a physical specimen. His name is Jim Carr. And um, uh, we, we hunted a backcountry hunt on horses. And this guy's used to like this guy shoots an elk in five miles, dude. And he doesn't care. He'll, yeah. you know, he'll make three <laughs> or four trips over the next. He'll pack the whole thing out. He's done it many times. Yeah. And, and so we went on this hunt and, and, and what he, what he, he, Said something to me that it was a compliment and you know because when we're down at the trailhead loading up you know got all this gear you know all this planning and everything and you know to him it's a little overwhelming he's like man i'd already be up the trail three miles here yeah yeah but once we got back in there <clears throat> you know we have a old, and, and, and i go all ultra light gear so i don't have to take any more horses than necessary yeah. and you know um um it was high country ten thousand feet you know it rains almost every day had a small stove so we could at least dry out where most guys are thinking stoves in september why would you take a stove in september oh well go get soaked and watch what happens dude you'll be yeah. you'll be at the hamburger stand because you, you'll yeah. be like i i gotta get dry where and, and what he said to me is he's like man he says even though you got all this gear and everything he says you are so efficient back here he says you know you don't you don't ride anywhere you don't need to you can be glassing you know 15 minutes out of camp if 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 it's fogged in 
you know, you can sit here and just, just look at the, the roof of the tent and, and you know, when the sun's coming out and bam, you're on, you're on the knob. And, yeah. and he says, so I, I kind of get it. What, what, why you go to all this trouble with the stock and everything. Cause you've got a good enough gear, you know, and, and dude, we got like two inches of rain while we were back there. And, and, um, you know, he was kind of surprised. I'm like, man, a chicken's got the brain the size of a pea and he doesn't yeah. go out in this stuff i'm not going out in it not unless i i know exactly like hey i saw the buck oh my gosh he's right yeah, down yeah. there oh crap of course of course i'm gonna i'm gonna tough it out but i'm like no let's just hang back they don't want to come back back out in the rain and and it's nothing to jump on a horse and climb 800 feet two or three times a day right you know to to, to, to catch the breaks and so so that's i was glad he kind of observed that you know because he does come from that backpacking uh sense where he would have been great for two or three days well dude i was back there 13 over over two or three trips you know i mean yeah, sure. and, and that was stock that, that 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 made that possible yep yep no that was uh i think you nailed like the the points on that and in in i guess i guess my last thing i would say about it, robbie is all, those are all like huge benefits and, and i don't like if somebody's thinking about i don't want to discourage people from getting into it. just realize it's like a big it's a big learning curve you know um but like like right. you just said, Robbie, there's a lot of pluses, you know. Yeah, if you have this, is what I would tell somebody: if you have the vision to use stock and you you really want to do it, do it, do it, and and just 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 be perseverant, you know. Like, dude, I even though I grew up with horses, you know, by the time I was twenty, I had to go buy my own. You know, I I started with one. You know, and then the next year I bought another one and then I got a little bit better trailer. And, you know, I, it, it still took me years to build into it. All I had going for me was, you know, Hey, Hey grandpa, how do I, how do I tie a half hitch on this? Or how do I tie a basket hitch? You know, I had that going for me, but somebody that had the vision and, and, and it, they, they could find a mentor to do that stuff. Oh, yeah. You know, there's, there's, there's Wrangler schools. Heck go work for an outfitter for a couple of weeks. The outfitters I know around here, they're dying for help. Oh yeah. And if you show up and say, Hey man, I'm going to work for you. I just want to learn a little bit about wrangling. I can't imagine anybody that would tell you no, unless you just are going to weigh down the hunt, you know, as long as you're bringing some value, there are ways to learn it. Oh yeah, sure. Sure. And I guess the other like woo woo part of my brain, Robbie, is that I just have nostalgia for it, man. Like, oh, yeah. like, well, like when I reflect on like my dad's opinion is if you don't have horses and mules, like you're not elk hunting. Like it doesn't even count. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he's like, like, well, like, why would you like, why would you kill an elk a half mile from the road if you didn't have a mule? Like, what are you like insane? So, but, but so it's different for me because that's like, and also my, you know, my business and everything else, like that's part of the adventure was the, 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 the pack animals. And so, it, you know, I, I, that nostalgia is also part of it for me. And I, and again, just like you said, if somebody wants to get into it, I think that should probably be part of it too. Like you want to, you, you kind of, you like want to be that, the, the guy that has his mules up in the mountains and, and it's a cool way to spend time in the mountains, I guess, is that is the way I would put it. It is, dude. And I'm glad you bring that up because, you know, I wanted to get that in there before we close up. A horse is a companion. And just the way hunting big mule deer works out, you're going to end up hunting alone a lot of days. It has to do with many things, you know, trying to find a, a partner you're equally yoked with. And I don't think there's any pursuit out there except for maybe bobsledding where you're, you know, you got to be pretty equally yoked. You know, you can't, you can't carry someone else's weight right. on a hunt. And, 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 and I'm talking the whole mental and, you know, the skill set and everything. Yep. It's pretty hard for somebody that's died in the wool. That's, that's there to, to get a big mule there to go with somebody that's just there for the experience. So you end up alone a lot, the tag situation where we're at right now, you yeah, end up sure. alone a lot hard to get a tag with a buddy you know it's just how it is you know different points you know different schedules you know all that stuff a horse is a companion and um i talk to my horses i mean oh, i yeah. sing to my horses i i play jokes on my horses i mean i i i do all I, they're a companion and dude they i know they keep me hunting longer and in a better mood when they're around, they, uh, they really do. And so, uh, you know, I, th th that's part of that nostalgia end of it to me is, 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 is I, I would be missing that 
you know, if I, if I didn't have that. And I learned that from my dad, you know, he was like, sure. Hey man, these, these, these make life better. And, and and I'll wrap it up with this. Kurt Garner said in his first book, you know, if, if you're horse packing and um, you are hunting and enjoying it and, 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 and in 30, I read that 35 years ago and you know what? The man was right. It's not yeah. always enjoyable, but there's always downsides. There's this, but it's pretty dang enjoyable, man. It brings a whole new element to the hunt. And, um, you know, it's, it's pretty awesome. I can't, I can't imagine doing it without that, without that angle. Um, and, and all the, uh, I count goats and, um, llamas and all that as stock too, but you're still sure. walking, you know? Um, yeah. and then sometimes that's a good, a good go between for guys, you know, maybe that's got a little lower barrier to entry. I don't know that for sure, but probably, yeah. um, you know, maybe, maybe that's, a, that's a way to kind of extend your, extend your, uh, wear and tear on your body is, is using that kind of stock too. Yeah, yeah, and I think you're right. I think you nailed it. For for a lot of folks, it's just easier to pick up, and and, and I think another reality there, um, Robbie, is they're less dangerous. You know, it, I mean, you know, yeah. horses and mules and stuff. If you don't get up the learning curve a little bit, you you know, you can put yourself in situations that are more dangerous than you might perceive. You know. Um, Yo, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, I kind of forget about that. I'm a little numb to that. I was in the hospital three weeks ago getting stitches in my right eye because a, a, a mare spun around and nailed me as I walked by. I think she thought she was trying to buy a buddy. And, um, <laughs> you know, in 98, I was in the hospital for a day from a horse. I mean, there is a danger element. There really is. Um, and you got to think about that. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, I yeah, think that's sure. part of the barrier to entry as well. But uh, Robbie, hey, thanks for being on, man. I, I've I've had you on here for over an hour and a half, man. And I think we covered a bunch of awesome stuff. Is there anything, anything you want to leave the listeners with? And, and, uh, also tell them, tell them your social media and that sort of stuff real quick too, so they can follow up and, and stay tuned with you. You bet, man. If you're a rock slide member, I'm on there every day on our forums. Um, uh, rock slide is R O K S L I D E rock slide.com. Big forum, jump on there. Um, I'm also on Instagram. Um, I'm not a, heavy poster and everything, but you know, I, I really, I really use Instagram. I, I want to encourage our next generation. I want to, I want to bring positive to social media. And, um, uh, and so I, I, I like, I like commenting on people's posts. I like encouraging people and everything. So say hi when you're on there. It's Robbie Denning, R-O-B-B-Y Denning, all one word. Um, not on Facebook much anymore. Um, but you know, say hi when you're on there and, um, you know, I'd love to, you know, tag me if you, if you put anything up that has to do with mule deer, man, I'll definitely comment or like, and, you know, I love stuff like that. And, and Cliff, I'm just, I, I, I was thrilled when you asked me to come on the, on the podcast, man, because you know, I, I ha that's how I know you. That's why I know there's a positive side to social media. That's how I know you. That's how I know Mark Smith, Muley Slayer. It's all through social media. And I just gravitate to the guys that are on there. It's not just, Hey, look at me. You know, it's like, Hey, this is what I can offer you. I've learned a lot about stock from you and just all your tips and everything, dude, that that's social, that's golden social media right there, man. So I appreciate that too about you. Thanks, man. No, I, I appreciate it. I feel this. I feel this way. I, the same way. I'm honestly, man, I see so much positivity in it. Yeah, there's all the negative stuff we can dwell on, but same thing, man. I've, I've met so many great people, particularly in the, in the hunting and outdoors community. So, so thanks, Robbie. I, I everybody go out there, buy Robbie's book. Um, if you're <laughs> beginner, experienced, whatever, go, go buy both of them and you'll learn a ton. So thanks, Robbie. Thank you, Cliff. Anytime you want to do it again, man, just let me know. All right. See you, man. I really enjoyed that conversation with Robbie. He's a great guy and a wealth of information. If you are interested in mule deer hunting, I highly recommend his books. Go out there and buy them. There's tons of interesting stories in there, a bunch of tips and tricks that'll take you up the learning curve. If you want to keep in touch with me, get on my website at pursuitwithcliff.com and sign up for the newsletter. Check out my YouTube channel. It's just under my name, Cliff Gray. And you can follow me on Instagram at cliffgry. Thanks for listening.